is a derech for Pesach. In other words, Purim, which basically the main message of Purim is that prayer works, that davening works. That's what Mordechai instilled in Ab Yisrael, to not give up, even when everything just seemed like a dead end wall and everything seemed futile through Haman and the panic and the fear instilled by Haman to the Jews. And yet Mordechai got the Jews to wake up and to do what was called Zaraqa Umara, a strong cry to Hashem. He got the message that miracles happen. And now the miracles of Purim were specifically mir miracles from within, within Teva, within the nature, hidden behind the, the nature to reveal Hashem is a greater miracle in a sense than Exodus leaving Egypt, the splitting of the Red Sea. Because who's not going to believe when there's an open miracle? But here, that behind the Teva, behind the nature, to reveal that Hashem is behind the scenes, that for Hashem is a greater miracle. And that's one of the reasons why Chazal teach that when Moshiach comes, the only Chad that will continue to exist is Purim. All the other Chadim, which are Zechad and Tziad Mitzrayim, won't exist anymore. Only Purim. Because Purim is connected to the future redemption, and that the greatest accomplishment is to reveal Hashem from behind the concealment. From the concealment, just like in the Megillah, not once Hashem's name is mentioned, but you see behind the scenes Hashem. So too, that's how the future redemption is. Rabbi Nachman, he taught clearly that Mashiach will conquer the whole world without throwing a single missile, a single bullet, no war, no physical nuclear missiles, whatever, all just through the power of his speech, his faculty of speech. He's going to have the whole world under his feet. And Rabbi Nachman teaches, Purim is a derech le Pesach, that by a person succeeding in having miracles happen to him, seeing clear miracles behind the nature, and recognizing as, as Hashem is divine providence guiding, then a person is zocher to live at a level where he has Pesach, open miracles. Clear open miracles. You see it, people don't see it. But you see it as a clear miracle, open miracle. You have the eyes already, the prescription set because of Purim, so you can see now the miracles of Pesach. So we're in this time now between Purim and Pesach, which is to bring mikoach el apoal from potential to actual, the concept of Hashem's guidance and miracles happening in life, which is basically what Hashem really wants. Hashem wants that His divine providence, His Ashgacha, should be revealed in the world. And that is obviously through prayer, through the speech. And that's the idea of Pesach, which, as the Arizal teaches, is Pesach. The mouth begins to speak. That's the whole gift. And the, again, the bottom underlying message of all this period of Purim and Pesach is that prayer, the speech comes out and things move because of speech. And not the attitude, ah, as Hashem doesn't listen to my davening, as if I'm doing something with my davening, me, old me, little me, tiny me. No, the opposite, that yes, every word counts. My own prayers, my tehillim, my siddur, my shacharis, my mincha, my marev, everything makes a difference. So this is the underlying message behind this amazing, amazing time. I wanted just to, in, in relationship to this, to say some, a story about an amazing breast of chassid who lived about 50, 60 years ago. His name was Rav Moshe Dov Rosenfeld. And it's worth just saying a little bit about this special person before telling an amazing story about him. He's the one, first of all, who was responsible to bringing Rabbi Nachman's chair to Eretz Yisrael. He smuggled it into Eretz Yisrael. He went, he was living in a village called Kremenchak, and in the village was someone who was a descendant of Rabbi Nachman who had Rabbi Nachman's chair. And he told him, he said, you're going to Eretz Yisrael, maybe take the chair with you. What's, what, what's going to happen to the chair here in Russia? What's going to be with it? Nothing's going to come out of it. So he gave it to him, and he knew that there's going to be problems if, by the KGB and whatever, to take out a chair. Why are you taking this chair? Maybe it has, it has some value and everything. So to prevent that from happening, he, he cut, he sliced the chair into small pieces, and he hid it in the lining of his luggage, of his suitcases, and then the big suitcases back then in the 1950s, whatever. And that's how he smuggled it into Eretz Yisrael. It was brought to Eretz Yisrael, and it was glued back together. The job was done terribly. <laughs> it was done very bad. And then a second time in 1987, some professional guy from the old city, I forgot his name, Katriels, I forgot the name of the upholstering uh, store. He fixed it up nicely, Baruch Hashem. It was done a second time in 1987. And recently, since it again needed some fixing up, they fixed it up again. But this is Rabbi Nachman's chair. This guy, he did Messiah Nefesh, Rabbi Moshe Dov Rosenfeld to bring it to Eretz Yisrael. An amazing story that's told about him, and he himself told this story, but he didn't say it was him, but the family who told over the story mentioned that it was him. 
The story goes that he, every Sunday morning, would travel from his village, Kremenchuk, to another village early Sunday morning to sell in the Jewish marketplace his goods. He was an expert in leather tanning. He was a, that was his uh, specialty in leather. And he would, right after Shabbos, right after Motzei Shabbos, it was a long winter journey on his wagon. He had back then a horse and wagon. We're talking about the 1920s still. In Ukraine, it was not unusual that people were still traveling by horse and buggy. Till today, if you go to the Ukraine in the winter, you'll see the, when there's a snowstorm, you can't drive, so you see the guys pull out the horses and the, the, the sleigh wagons, you know, with the, with the skis or whatever. You can still see it today. In the villages in the Ukraine. So he would set off. Motzei Shabbos with his wa horse and his wagon and his merchandise loaded with uh, armed with a rifle and he would travel all night to get in the morning before davening time to get to the village before the market began so he would do right after Havdallah he would get on the wagon prepare everything and he would do Malava Malka while traveling you have, not, you have nothing else to do it's a long winter night it's just on the, on the road you can concentrate so he was doing Malava Malka and he was singing this mirot so one Motzei Shabbos, while traveling, he was singing the Nigunim, the breast lover Nigunim for Lava Malka, and he was singing one song called Adir Ayum, Adir Ayum Venora. And then all of a sudden he heard a voice coming from the forest, completing the next stanza. He froze. <laughs> he froze in the middle of the winter. It's light, it's like 8, 9 p.m., freezing cold from the forest, the voice is coming. What is this? He stopped and he took his rifle, he was scared. He got down, and he continued singing the next part. And he hears the voice again, continue. And he's trying to locate where the voice is coming from. And he's going, and he continues singing, and he gets to a corpse, a Jewish corpse, Met Mitzvah. A Jew who was killed, or Shabbos, or before Shabbos, lying there in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, the snow, in the forest. He quickly took the body, put it back on his wagon, Drove back, forget about his work, he went back home to bury the, the, the Yid, the pastor, who was killed. Looks like he was murdered. But this is, the, this is the type of person we're talking about. This is a special person. His whole life was just solid in Muna. He, he left Russia, Ukraine, in the 1950s. And again, the purges and the attacks of Stalin and the communists against any Torah education, he raised children to be religious Jews. How did he do it? He got a doctor, a Jewish doctor, he bribed him. To, get, to, make a, to sign certificates at his, he had about two or three boys that they all died. And they really didn't die. You got them that the, there's a certificate that the, they died because then you have the children. The, the, the communists, they said like this, the older people we can't get, but the children we're going to get. We want the children. So every child had to be forced in, in a secular school, which was all atheist in, in Russia, obviously, right? So he got a doctor to make certificates and his kids died. That way there's no problem that they have to, have to go to a secular school. They're dead, chas right? He purposely bought a house at the edge of the village Kremenchag, where it's, there's no neighbors. And it's the, the house was facing, the back of the house, there was the river. And he had the front door and the back door facing so they could see who's coming in. In case the KGB would come to his house, his kids, who he was secretly educating toward education in the house, as soon as someone would come, there's no neighbors who can, who can spy on them and uh, slander on them and whatever. They can immediately go out the back door into the, the rafts, the little boats, and to sail off in the river. And he found a, an educated man, because he was working all day, a, a Tamit Chacham. He got him also like a permit that he, he's disabled, so he, he's exempt from working. And he paid him all day to teach Torah to his kids. That's how he raised, he succeeded and giving the Torah education to his kids in the Ukraine in the 1940s, 1950s, until he got his exit visa. They all got out, amazingly, and they came out with Hashem, and he brought them to Eretz religious Jews. So now him, he was one of the best, the biggest experts in, in, uh, in te leather tanning. And because of that, the Soviet government, they put him in charge of one of the biggest factories in the Ukraine, close to where he lived in Kremenchag, he was in charge of the, the, the biggest leather factory, and they needed him because he was, had special expertise that not other, other people had. So they, they, he was there, and he was walking around with his big beard and his face. They couldn't do anything because they needed him. Until years passed, and other people in the poor Soviet economy built up and became expert as much as him. Then they wanted to do away with him. And they put false charges and everything, and they sent him to jail. A jail which wasn't so far from Berdichev. And the, the jails, the prisons back then, were filled with many Jews who were taken in on false charges. 
and the majority, probably 99% of the Jews who entered there for false charges, they lost, they dropped their Yiddish kite one thing after the next. They couldn't hold on. The non-kosher food and the conditions, the, the, the standards of living in the jail and the conditions. So the average Jews, as, as, as they got in, they just dropped their Yiddish kite. And the attitude of someone who falls into a despair situation, when they see somebody else still holding on, there's an envy, a hatred towards that person. Like Rabbi Nachman once told Rabbi Nassim in Rabbi Nachman's wisdom, Sikhot Aran, that it's a big level to hold that if I can't make it in my Yiddish kite, then at least, at least let the second person succeed. If I can't make it, then let him succeed. And Rabbi Nassim said, I thought this was obvious, that true Avat Yisrael, if I can't make it in life, let the other person make it. But no, life has proven that people are not like that. The attitude is if I can't make it, then he can't make it either. He's not going to make it. If I can't make it, it didn't work out for me, then it shouldn't work out for him. And that was that is a normal attitude, and it was unfortunately a normal attitude also in <coughs> Russia at the time. So when he came to jail, all these Jews already cut off their beard, their payas, and they took off their kippahs, no religious, any identity at all, no Jewish identity at all. When they saw him, when he had a big beard, he had a hajat panim, he was very, he had a strong build. When he came in, they said, ah, you're going to fall just like we fell. <laughs> it's a matter of days. And they kept on pushing him off, and he was holding on only with the eight the advice of Yidbo Lidut, of talking to Hashem, and davening to Hashem, and connecting to Hashem. That's what kept him alive. That's what kept him on go going on. So came now, and he was holding on, and they were shocked. It was ready a week, two weeks, a month, a few months. It was before Pesach now. And they said to him, Reb Moshe Dov, how are you going to hold on here? All they serve here is non-kosher food in chametz. Seven days you're not going to eat. No bread, no nothing, no fruit. What are you going to eat? There's, they don't, they don't, purposely they'll serve only chametz and tray food. What are you going to eat? You're not going to make it. So he told them, you'll see, I'm not going to be here. He said, what do you mean you're not going to be here? He said, I can't handle, I can't imagine myself eating chametz on Pesach. For me, it's impossible. I can't handle that. That's my, that's my border. My border is, I cannot, even if now, according to Allah, I'm, allowed, I'm in danger, this and that, you're allowed to eat, I can't imagine myself eating chametz on Pesach. I can't. It's like killing me, to the torture. Even if I have a permit and everything and enter, I can't. So therefore, because I can't, look what he said. I know that Hashem won't send me this test. He won't send me a test which is above my level. This is, this is my border. This is my gvul, atkan. And I know that Hashem is not going to throw me in this test. And they said, you'll see, we'll see. So two weeks before Pesach, they kept on bugging him every day. Moshe Dov, two weeks left. And he kept on saying, you'll see. And they said, you, you'll see, we'll, you, we'll, we'll see, you'll see. <laughs> it went on a week before Pesach. What are you going to do, Moshe Dov? And he was davening out his kishkas to Hashem, mamash, to save him. Please don't put me in this situation. Please don't let me be zman chirutein at the time of salvation. To be stuck in this place, in this game, I can't, Hashem, I can't, I'd rather be dead. I can't. He kept on davening like that. Arrived, Erev Pesach, he's still in jail, and the Jews, the inmate said, No, what are you going to do? And he said, You'll see. Noon time, noon time, the officers, they come to his, his room in the, in the prison, their faces blank white. They open the door, they said, We just got an order from the Kremlin, you're free to go. No explanations, <laughs> nothing. They open the door. They let him out. He quickly ran. You know, he, has to, he has to get, it's Erev Pesach, he has to get to a Jewish community, a shul, something for Pesach. He ran, he ran right by foot, because that's how they let him out. No, no transportation, nothing. You're out, no food, no money, nothing. Just let him out like that. He got to Berdichev, Mamash, at the camera <coughs> time. He got into a shul. He was taken to <coughs> the family, he had the said there. Everything was organized. Everything was made. Unbelievable. What's the message of this story? Something amazing. Is that Mamash Hashem comes into a person when he needs him. And also, if you turn to him sincerely and honestly, and you, you're open with Hashem, and you, 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 you know that you can't handle a certain test, then you, and you turn to Hashem for that, then the chances are that yes, you will visit Hashem make it in life. We, we've, everyone has gone through many, many difficulties, many failures in life and everything. Where was Hashem there? Where was Hashem there? Obviously, if we look back, to get to where we want to in life, we need a strong level of ratzon, of desire, which can only be built up through the faculty of speech, which is the expression of your ratzon. Like Rabbi Nachman teaches in Lesson 31, Nikutim 1, 
that the expression of the Ratzon is the soul, right? And he said he brings a pasuk from Song of Songs, Shir Shirim, Nichsefa vegam karta nafshi. The meaning, Nichsefa vegam karta, the kisufin, the yearning, and the kalot, the pining, vegam karta dash nafshi. This is my soul. The soul of a person is expressed in his yearning. Okay, so the, se the soul is yearning. That's what Yashir is teaching in this connection. Nechseva vegam karta is nafshi. And how does a person's nefesh express itself? Another verse in Shiashiri. Nafshi yatsea vedabiro. In the speech comes out the nefesh. The nefesh is expressed in speech. When a person utilizes his faculty of speech, the organ of speech, properly, which is in words of prayer to Hashem, of turning to Hashem, then you develop this connection. And this is your key for survival. They, they just put out an article about Rav Sheik, who just passed away. And they wrote about uh, his biography a little bit, some pieces of his, of his life. So he's, he, was, he was giving it over. Before he passed away, they interviewed him. And he said like this, Rav Sheik. He said there that um, in the 1950s, there were no Bresla books at all available in America. Nothing. It was a wilderness. Not even, not even, forget about the English books, the Hebrew books. There were no Hebrew books at all. And he, by chance, came across two books which saved his life, changed his life. Meshivat Nefesh and Ishtabchut Nefesh. In English, Restore My Soul, which is entirely encouragement not to give up in life. Another book called Ishtabchut Nefesh, Outpouring of the Soul, who talks about the power of talking to Hashem, the power of Yitbolidut. So he, he made it as a goal, as a teenager. He said, when I can, I'm going to print these books and sell them for dirt cheap that anyone can buy them. And he did that in the 1950s. He was one of the first ones Together with other Breslov Hasidim in New York, he began to publish the Breslov books. And he would go around with a bag of these books, selling them for like pennies, literally. Going for on Sunday when people didn't work, and the people were on Sunday, they, they had their bagel and cream cheese uh, breakfast in, in the shuls on Sunday morning in America. So he'd go from shul to shul with a bag with his books and selling them. So he came to, and, 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 and there's, the, the, there's tons of shuls in Borough Park in Brooklyn, that's the area that he was in. So he went to one show called Sigit, which is like Satmar, and he came there giving these books, and these people had never seen these books before, never. So there was one old man who survived the Holocaust, he went through a ter terribly bitter life, he bought a copy of the Ishtabchut and Efesh, and he started to look through it, and he said, where was this book 50 years ago? Where was this, if I would have had this book 50 years ago, and I would have known the value of prayer, of talking to Hashem, my life would have been totally different now. I wouldn't have gone, had to go through and have the attitude of what I went through in life like it actually unfolded. I would have had a much better life than now. Bitter and miserable chas v'sham. He said, where was this? I needed this 50 years ago. And he stressed this point to say that it's a little, there was a wilderness in the world. And these books have saved people's lives. And that's why he was so into spreading the message. But this message of the power of prayer is again, what comes out of Pesach and Purim is so important. Another story, an amazing story. I always say this story again and again because it's so, it's so powerful. And in the time, in the, the KGB, the Communist Russia time, there was a young man, a Bachur, teenager, who had discovered the teachings of Breslev, the teachings of Hidbodidut, of talking to Hashem, and he began to practice it. And he was taken, we're talking about the 1920s, 1930s, he was taken on false charges to Siberia, Many Jews were there, and to purposely break him, what did they do, the, the, the officials there, the police, the, the guys in charge there? They made him work in putting in the logwood into the fire, which heated up the whole camp. The freezing cold Siberia, they had a big heating room with tons of fire and tons of log to, that had to be constantly being put into the fuel of the fire. So you needed people to be able to do that constantly, and they had shifts. So they purposely put him in one shift in the room. It's a big room, and he's alone in the room. You work with another worker there. They put him with the daughter of a priest. The, I think it's a Greek Orthodox in Russia, right? They married. They had children, the, the priest in Russia. So as a daughter of a priest, they purposely put him alone in the room with the daughter of this priest in order to make him fall, in order to make him to break him and to, to be with her. He was going nuts. Teenager, what do you want from him? And the, the, it's warm in the room. And from her side, she was ready to, to be with him. And he was going crazy, going crazy. That night, the first night after that first day of work, 
he went to the, the freezing cold, the forest in the freezing cold. There was no fence around the, the camp in Siberia because he would freeze to death after an hour. So they, they didn't, you can just go out, you're not going to come back. You can try to run away, you'll escape and you'll die. It's very simple. So there was no fence around it. They let him go. He's walking around. And he started to tell Hashem, like this, he said, Hashem, I'm not going to make it. I'm telling you clearly, you're testing me in a test above my level. I'm going to crack. I'd rather die in the freezing cold than to do this terrible. I know this is a terrible act. I can't do this. I'm a Jew. I can't do this. Hashem, I'd rather be dead than to do this. He was crying like that for one hour. And then the freezing cold almost killed him. He couldn't handle it. He, wanted, he was willing to freeze to death. He was willing. Because he was in such pain from this situation that he was in. He'd rather die in freezing cold than to be tested like this. He couldn't handle it. He came back. The next day, the same scenario. Again. She's in the room, he's in the room, she's, she's willing, there's temptation. He held on, he was going nuts. And again, he went out again the same night, crying to Hashem, I can't, I can't hold on, please take me away, just, just finish with me, I can't. And again, after an hour of freezing, almost he couldn't handle the, the pain of the cold, he came back. This went on for three years. Three years. How do we know the story? Because he told the story afterwards, we'll, we'll get to that point. Three years went on. And after three years, he got out. He, was, he got released from Siberia. She had a longer term. For whatever she did, this lady, she had a longer term. So the day that he was saying his goodbyes in the cafeteria, the lunchroom in, in Siberia, so she stood on a chair, on the, on the binko, on the bench, and uh, she said in front of everybody, if there's one tzaddik amongst the Jewish nation, I will testify that it's this young man. And she said in front of everybody, three years we were alone in the room, together with the, with the firewood. He didn't touch me even once for three years. For three years, he got out. After that, he came, he came to the breast of a chassid and we told him this is what happened, what he had to go through. They were crying because what, what, what the test that he had to go through. But the point is, the power of prayer to help a person to have the supernatural, super, supernatural kochot that he needs to survive in life. This is the power of prayer to come in the most difficult situations. If we now look at the picture of what we get from Purim and we get what we get from Pesach, it's two items. We said earlier on Purim, the power of prayer was revealed through specifically Mordechai. Mordechai Yehudi, Mordechai the Tzaddik, he instilled people with the power of prayer. So basically what comes out of Purim is the, the, this Power dosage, it's called, Arizal calls it, the, it's called Ha'arat Mordechai. That at the time of the Megillah reading, if you're Zohar, if you have the merit, you can see what's called the light of Mordechai. What is it? It's like a hippie thing, it's like a, a high, it's more than that. The light of Mordechai is that the light of a tzaddik, this tzaddik Mordechai, comes into you and gives you supernatural kochot to become and to do and to break barriers that normally you couldn't do. And the term, if we go right into Kabbalah a little, and the terminology of the Kabbalah, it's what's called Ibu Nefesh. There's a terminology, and Arizal explains that when a Jew is in danger, if he has a schut, if he has a merit, and the soul of a tzaddik who passed away already can do what's called Ibu, enter him for a temporary time, enter that person, and give him this extra boost to overcome situations, to get out of ruts, to get out of difficult situations. He explains the Arizal, Arizal, this is the basic explanation of people who do tshuva. At the beginning of the tshuva, there's a big light. Where does that light come from? It comes from this tzaddikim. Specifically, the Arizal says that the neshama of Moshe Rabbeinu himself enters a person who's so far and trapped and gets them up, gets them to wake up and pulls them out also. So it's called Ibu Nefesh. This, in short, is the message of porn. A wake-up call from a light above my level, that's the boost of the light of porn. That's what's called the Simcha of porn, which has in it the light of porn, the light of Mordechai, to, it's like, a, it's like a born again. It's like a person who's on the deathbed in the hospital and the beep beep went down, it's dead. And they give the electric shock boost to wake him up. That's what porn is. Porn is someone who's mamash on the verge of, <laughs> he's verge of death. He's like finished, chas shalom. He's trying so much to hold on in, 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 in Muna, in his life, in a positive attitude, it's just not working out. All of a sudden, Purim comes along at the darkest part of the year. It's the end of the month. Adar is the last month. It's what Haman saw, the month that Moshe Benu passed away. But he didn't know that's the month that Moshe Benu was also born. 
meaning that it's an end, there's darkness, but there's also a special light that can be tapped into in the month of Adar, which is the light of, of Purim. And this boost is the light of the tzaddikim to give that person that wake-up call. What then? Now that I've been awakened with this boost, like this electric shock to get up, now comes in the idea of Pesach. The whole idea of Pesach comes out in the beautiful verses in Shir Shirim, which is the, the Megillah, the song of Pesach, right? It says, Yonati bechag vehasela beseter hamadrega harin yet marai hashmin et kolech ki kolech arev umarech nave, right? Hashem compares Am Yisrael when they reach the Red Sea before it split, you're like my dove. A dove who's running away from an eagle, a type of a, a, a net who's trying to run after the, 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 the Yona, the dove, Am Yisrael, to, to, to devour. <coughs> so she finds some rocks and crevices and cracks in the rocks. She goes in only to find a snake waiting there to swallow up the dove. To go in, she can't. To go out, she can't either because the, 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 the eagle's after to eat her. And to go in again, the snake. So what does she start doing? She starts flapping her wings so that the owner of the dove, the dove coat, can hear her and save her. So that's again the verses in Shia Shirim. Yonati bechag ve'asela, my dove, Hashem says, my dove, Am Yisrael, who at the time when you reached the splitting of the Red Sea, you had the sea in front of you, you couldn't go forward. You had the Egyptians behind you, chasing you, you couldn't go back. To the right and the left was the, was the desert and where they saw giant scorpions and snakes also there. They couldn't budge. So what did the Jews do? They took the umanut of Avotehem, the, 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 the craftsmanship, the workmanship of their ancestors, which is Tadavim. Tadavim, they start to cry out to Hashem. And that's what Hashem says there again. The verses, you were like my Yonati Bechag Yasela, like my dove in the cracks of the rock, right? So Hashem says, Hashmi'enit Kolech, let me hear your voice. Hashem says, I want to hear what you do when you're in danger. What do you do when you're being pursued in life? What do you do? Do you run to this physician, to this doctor, do you call this person for help, or would you turn to Hashem? Would you turn to Hashem? That's what you're supposed to do. That's the ultimate hishtadlut. He explains Rabbi Nachman in Lesson 62 that people have an attitude, listen, Hashem will help you, but you got to do hishtadlus. you got to do something. So people normally talk like that. They have that attitude that we believe in Hashem. Look, we dove in, we keep Shabbos, we put up the thing. But we believe also that you have to, you can't, be, you can't be a parasite and sit behind. You have to do something. You have to go to work. You have to go to a doctor if you're sick. You have to do. So people normally who talk like that towards others and push that, for example, parents, or when, they, when they have a child who's doing tshuva and he wants to like, advance in his Torah education, the main attack is this attack of the pranasa issue or, or healing, whatever. So the attitude is they, they, there is a sham, but they also believe in what's called an emtsahi. They believe in a middleman, a means. What's the problem in that? Hashem designs it that, yes, in this world you have to do a means. But because the person, lechatchila, initially, and from the start, he has the attitude that there's Hashem and the means, and if you don't do the means and Hashem can't help you, that Rabbi Nachman calls a blemish in faith. Because your attitude should be, there's only Hashem. And if Hashem wants me to work, Hashem wants me to go to the doctor, so let him push me in that situation. If that's what he wants, be'emet lamito, that's what Hashem really wants of me, then let it happen. I'm not against it. But I don't want to jump in to believe that it's this plus the, the emtsai, it's called, the middle means. He says, Rabbi Nachman, that was basically the blemish of the golden calf. That they said, Asher yelchu lefanenu, they believed in Hashem, but they needed a guy. The, the Moshe Rabbeinu, the, the Satan made the, uh, the, the, the imagery that Moshe Rabbeinu died. He made the whole world black and chaos. And they saw an image of Moshe Rabbeinu's coffin floating in the air. So they felt they needed guidance, they needed a tzaddik, a replacement for Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, in one hand, he was a middleman, but on the other hand, he's not. Because the tzaddik, you don't dove into the tzaddik. But rather, the tzaddik gives guidance and teaches how people, how to connect to Hashem. In that sense, he was a middleman to give people to come to their potential, to bring people to their potential, to bring out who they really are. So, but they, when Moshe Rabbeinu disappeared, so there was a blemish in their Muna that there's no more Moshe Rabbeinu, so we need an Emtsai, a middleman to help us. And this was the blemish of the golden calf, basically, why they made it. And he says an extension, a derivative of that, is people have attitude that there's a Shem, but there's what's called Hishtadlut. And Rabbi Nachman teaches, your main Hishtadlut is only the turn to a Shem who's called, in the, the, the language of the Zohar, Sibat Kola Sibot. He's the means of all the means. In other words, he created all the means. 
So if he's called the means of all the means, why not maybe first turn to Hashem and ask Him to help you? And then if as a result of the turning to Hashem, you've put, you're pushed in a situation, yes to do this type of work, yes to go call a doctor, fine. But when the Lechatchil of a person is added to, you know, there's Hashem and there's a Ishtadlut, so that is a blemish of faith. And it's reflected in these type of people that when they're faced with a difficult situation, they immediately turn to the means as opposed to what they're supposed to do, which is turning to Hashem. And the message of Pesach is Hashmi'in Yed Korech, where a person is totally squeezed until there's only Hashem. He's forced to turn to Hashem, and only then he turns to Hashem. And our goal, Pesach, this message is that it should always turn to Hashem, and from that should come out doing other things. Rav Nosen, the disciple of Rabbi Nachman, he had a son, Rav Yitzchak, who was in charge of the local bank and the post office in the city of Tulchim. At, at the time, the, the, the local post office was also the local bank, and he was in charge of it. And so he was, in a way, he had, he had a source of income. He was okay, in a way. And he had a chavruta, a Rav Mordechai, who he loved very much, and he made a deal that it, whatever he would buy for himself, he would also buy for his friend. That means if he needed a new winter coat, he wouldn't buy himself a winter coat unless he had enough money to buy us also a second winter coat for this Rav Mordechai. So he told his father about this act, this devotion. And he wanted to see that he was impressed with that. So Rav Nosen said to him like this, if this idea came to you as a result of davening to Hashem, turning to Hashem, and this idea came to you, I envy you. But if this is like a sikhli, it's an intellectual thing that you just came out of a rationale and reasoning, I don't envy this devotion. If it came about through emuna, through prayer, then I envy you. Rav Nosen, just to know about Rav Nosen, he was, said, he was someone who said about himself at the end of his life, <clears throat> I've spoken so much to Hashem in my life that I reached a point now, he said this at the end of, at the end of his life, I reached a point now that I can't do anything in life without first talking to Hashem about it. First I want to talk to Hashem about it, let it come through prayer what to do, as opposed to just let me think about it. When people say let me think about it, instead they should say let me daven about it, and then the thinking process will come out of the davening. I once knew a money changer in Me'a Sharim, and he is not a breast liver chassid, but he would come at certain times to pray at the breast liver shul, an older man, and I took the opportunity to talk to him a little of his memories, his memoirs of the Breast of a Chassid, and he had good memories of the older Breast of a Chassid. So he would tell me that there was a tremendous level of honesty and truth in one specific elder, his name was Rav Yitzchak Bender. He said once, he, he offered him a, like a, a good deal, like a good you know, a business deal with a, like a, a big thing that can bring in staka money for the Breast of Shul. And it was something that you know, was so clear that it's such a good profit, it's a good idea. He thought on the spot he would say, yes, it's a great idea. So the Yitzhak Bender said to him, let me get back to you tomorrow. And he was saying to himself, the money changer, I just presented him something which is so clear that it's something good and positive. Why does he need time to think about it? So the next day he came, he said, okay, let's do it. So I asked him, why did you wait a day? It was so clear and obvious. I'm telling you something good, something positive, something with this clear profit. It's like one plus one is two. That's how clear it is. Why did you say, get, I'll get back to you tomorrow? He says, I wanted to daven about it first. I wanted to ask Hashem and let it come about through <coughs> prayer. In the Zohar also, you see this in the Zohar, there was Rabbi Yeva Saba. Rabbi Yeva Saba, he was amazing. It's brought down this story a few times in the, in the Zohar. Before eating, he would set his table. He had a table, when it came time to eat breakfast or lunch, whatever, he would set the table with food. And before eating, we would start asking Hashem, Hashem, I have nothing, help me, please, let me, please, let me have food to eat, let me nourish me. He would dove into Hashem as if he had nothing. And once he dove in, then he would sit down and, and eating his food to show that he believed that all the food is through dove. Even though he had food now at home and he had the table set, he wanted everything to come through dove. In. This is basically <coughs> the message of Pesach, is move your lips, move those lips. Rabbi Rav Nachman, a big breast of Rav he said, the mouth is like a mill, a millstone grinding, grinding the flour. The mill doesn't, doesn't stop. They make it grind in 24 hours a day sometimes to grind flour, you know? So the, the lips are like that. are like the two stones grinding the, the flour. And always you have to produce, produce words, talk, take, take time. Instead of just sitting there on the bus staring, you know, at the newspaper and the articles and people, it's an opportunity to just, you know, disappear, talk to Hashem, 
Time in this world is limited. Every second we have here is tremendous wealth. If you look at the beginning of the Mishnah Bura, the very first Biro Halacha, the beginning of the Mishnah Bura, he lists about five or six mitzvah that a Jew can do constantly by even thought. He brings there, for example, just thinking about Hashem is considered you're credited with a mitzvah. You have certain things you can do constantly and gain from it. And Rabbi Nachman teaches one of the greatest accomplishments in this world is opening your mouth, talking to Hashem. You're credited with tremendous, tremendous sachar for that. You don't see it immediately, but as time proceeds, the sach, when the mouth is opened and it's conversing with Hashem, you begin to see things in life. Your emuna, he's Rabbi Nachman teaches that emuna is in the hands, meaning the, 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 the doing. It says, for example, that the war of Amalek, that Moshe Rabbein, it says about Moshe Rabbeinu's hands at the time that Yoshua was, un, was sent out to war, Vahi Yadav Emunah, his hands were trustworthy, were, were faithful. As Moshe's hands were faithful, which, which the Targum uncle is trans, he ran, renders it as Prisan Bitzlo. Moshe Rabbeinu's hands were spread out in prayer. So there, again, look at the translation. Yadav Emunah, his hands were faithful, and Targum explained it as he was spread out in prayer. Hands, prayer, emuna are one thing. He said once, Rabbi Nachman, I say emuna is in the hands. When they write on the dollar bill and God we trust, <laughs> it doesn't go that far. Emuna, you have to you have to back it. You say, of course I believe in God. Of course, you have people who are totally not observant and say, of course I believe in the Lord. I believe in God. We have to show it. The expression of emuna, he teaches, is mainly through davening. The return to Hashem. We talk to Hashem. This is the gift of Pesach. We should be zochem v'zat Hashem to to gain this gift, to drag it to the whole year through the power of prayer v'zat Hashem to complete the building of the spiritual Beit Hamikdash to prepare for Mashiach to come and to bring the recognition of Hashem to the entire world v'zat Hashem b'mirav yamei. Whenever there's a Brit Milah, Rabbi Nachman's chair is the kisei aliyah. Psh, what a child! He has a schut to sit on Rabbi Nachman's chair. They put the child on as the kisei liyau. On that's that that that's the key. they put him on the chair, and there's another chair for the sandal. But that's when it comes out, and they take it out. Yeah. But when the Bnei Israel they wanted to cross the Red Sea, and yeah. Hashem said to Moshe, "Don't pray. It's not you time to. It's not time to to pray." So right. you, you take this example, but you didn't finish the story. Okay. Moshe Rabbeinu was not supposed to pray. Am Yisrael already prayed. They davened already. Moshe Rabbeinu was to, to, to continue, and Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, now is not the time. Lo Rashi brings down. It's not a time to dove in longly, a long time. Why? Because now we know what to do. What's, what has to be done? They have to just walk into the sea, and it's not going to stand in their way. They should start walking into the sea. There was, there's a, there's a <coughs> sefer called Onik Shabbat, Rabbi Feynman. He was a breast liver. He passed away in 1940. 48, 49, he was a very special man. This guy. I'll tell a story about this guy also, Rabbi Feinel, Rabbi Shalom. He explained like this, <clears throat> when Hashem sends in your head clear what to do, in other words, you daven, and you have an idea what has to be done, so don't continue davening. Stop and do it. If now Hashem sends you the idea what to do, so do it. Mm -hmm. So that's the message that comes out, that Moshe Rabbeinu thought it's a time now to daven long. And Hashem said, whoa, whoa, stop. Now is not a time to be ma'arich and tefillah, because now they're in a time of danger, and I'm revealing the advice, what has to be done. What is the Eitzah that comes out of the Ami Yisrael davening? And he says also Rashi, their Kedai, and the Sput of their ancestors, Avraham Yitzhak and Yaakov is Kedai for them, that the, split, the, the, the sea should split for them, on their behalf. And also Yosef HaTzadik, with the body of Yosef HaTzadik, it says, Vayanos, Vayetzea Hayam Ra'a Vayanos, the sea saw and fled. What did it see? It saw the merit of Yosef at Sadiq that it says about him when Potiphar's wife tried to tempt him. Vayanos vayetzea The same word, Vayanos vayanos, appears by Hayam Ra'a vayanos and Azeshe Moshe. And by Yosef at Sadiq, when she tried to seduce him, Vayanos, the same word, vayetzea So all these things together, the sea was ready to split for him. So the Eitzah was revealed, and Hashem told Moshe it's Lo et laharich bitfilah. But they did the davening already. She Hashem says that clearly. Hashmin et kolech. Rashi brings down. The Midrash so says that they did daven already. The davening was done. Now is the time for the sea to split. And now is not the time to, to Moshe Rabbeinu daven. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu daven? Because you had the four groups of Jews. One of the four, including the Erev Rav, including Datan and Abimam, 
They started to attack Moshe Rabbeinu. Look what you did to us. You didn't want to kill us. You want to drown us. What, there's not enough graves in Egypt. You want to drown us here. So because of their lachats, he was, he was davening. But they were the faithful Jews. Rav Shiva brings down the four kitot, four groups. There were those, those groups of Jews who did the right thing, which is to turn to Hashem. And their merit, the, the, the sea split for everyone. So Moshe Beinu, because of the lachats, he had to daven. According to Pshat, he had to daven. He did that. And Hashem said, whoa, that's not the time. What has to be done? Tell them to walk in. Nachshon is the first one who jumped in. And the sea even reached up. It wasn't splitting until it reached a certain point, And then it split for everybody. But, but we see that the davening is at a certain time. When you know what to do, don't just keep on davening. Right? I remember once, it was like a Holocaust movie, I remember. I think it was based on a true story that the, the Jews could, could have escaped. And there was one Jew who was telling other prisoners, come, come. And they were just continuing doing, doing the vidui. They didn't want to move. They, 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 they'd given up already. They were doing their vidui. And the Jew was telling them, come, come. They didn't, want to, they didn't move. They didn't budge. They stayed there. They were killed afterwards. But the one who was uh, telling them, now, if you know what to do, it's clear. You were turning to Hashem already. You were you're living a life of Emunah. Hashem sends you the message. So do it. Stop and do it. That's what Hashem wants. That's the Ishtad that Hashem wants of you now. It's clear. So do it. All right. How do you know the message is from Hashem and not your own rationale? So Rav Nassim asked that question. He asked that question in line of a person asking Hashem, to guide him according to the real truth. Rav Nassim explains like this. <clears throat> it's an amazing topic, very, very profound, that there's what's called the truth, and then there's the real truth. There's my personal truth that I believe to be the truth, and there's Hashem's truth. And I'm not 100% sure that my personal truth, my hashkafa, my perspective, how I'm living my life, I don't know 100% that it's in line with Hashem's truth when He wants it. I don't know. I don't assume. <laughs> Because of that, King David says, the famous Psalm 25, King David requests Hashem, I don't want to be guided according, I don't want you to guide me according to my truth, what I perceive as being the truth. I want your truth. I don't know what your, your truth is, Hashem. In the meantime, I'm doing what I believe to be the truth, but I'm open in life that when you send me a message to change, I'm ready on the spot to change. So Rav Nassim says, how can you know the real truth when you see it in the face. So he says it's one condition, your sincerity. If you know, not for the sake of other people looking, you're sincere, you close yourself in a room, you run out the forest, and from your kishkas, from your heart, you sing Hashem, I really need your help. I don't know what you want of me to do right now. What should I make a decision? Should I make a right? Should I make a left? Should I go forward? Should I stay still? What should I do, Hashem, in this situation? Should I sign the contract? Should I marry this woman? Should I move to Israel? Should I put my kids in this type of education? What? Should I dress like this or like that? What do you want to be in my life? When you're sincere, Rav Nussan writes this, you can be rest assured that the outcome of life after that type of davening is in line with the, what you asked, the real, the real, the real message that, that Hashem is guiding you. Because you were sincere. That's the most important thing. Karov Hashem lechol korav. Right? Hashem is close to all those who call out to Him. On what condition? To all those who call out to Him, honestly, sincerely, with truth. That's the thing. Hashem is close to you. Hashem will help you. On what condition? That you have no strings attached. That when you're coming to Him, there's no pinyot, there's no ulterior motives, there's no, there's no static. It's just you and Hashem, and you're on you, you, who you really are, your heart, your full heart there. And you're asking Hashem, please Hashem, I need guidance. Is it a right? Is it a left? What is it, Hashem? I don't know anymore. I can't, do, I can't handle it anymore, Hashem. Open me, open up the, the gates and show me. So no sin, he writes clearly, you can rest assured that as life develops after this type of davening, that it's in line with what Hashem wants to do. And you're understanding the message properly.